recording. Now everybody else can switch off their uh, microphones. Okay. Well, welcome to um, another Black History Lunchtime conversation. Um, it's good to see you all um, this morning, this evening, whenever it is for you. Um, and um, we're very much looking forward to um, hearing from Professor Fwachak from the University of Jos in Nigeria. So this is a really interesting uh, um, topic that you've, uh, you've chosen. So um, I think, well, just to say how very grateful I am, Professor Sati, um, and I'm sure we all are for the times that you've come to join our lunchtime conversations to help us through and particularly to be seeing Black history from an African history point of view and telling the story from an African perspective, a black perspective rather than um, the other way around. So I think uh, the best thing to do would be for you to uh, to tell us, um, introduce your, your subject and um, go through that. Thanks very much indeed, Professor Sati. Okay, thanks Liz. Um, maybe some housekeeping job yet first. Uh, how many minutes do I have? 10, 15, or? 20, and then questions. Okay. Yeah, plenty of time. Thank yeah. you. I'm not sure I can be very accurate with time today, but if I'm exceeding, warn me. OK, <laughs> no problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I thought this conversation about the color burden and the African response um, was important because um, racism is experienced differently by different people across different cultures. And so for us in Nigeria, uh, racism is a historical uh, development and it has passed through several historical trajectories. And so it's not like something that is changeless, it's something that is mutating. And for each of the epochs of which Africans in Nigeria or Nigerians in Africa, uh, in, in Nigeria um, have confronted racism they have confronted it uh, in the context in which it appeared. But from a general perspective, Nigerians have confronted racism in Nigeria, mainly as a collective group. Uh, the individualized uh, experience of racism is not so much documented as the collective one. So the story I'm going to tell is the story of the collective racism that Nigerians have gone through in uh, times past. Um, for this, I'm going to look at how they responded to slavery, how they responded to colonialism, and how they responded to colonial experiences, post-colonial experiences where racism was involved. Uh, we all know that um, in, in, in terms of slavery, slavery is a very old institution in human history. Uh, it didn't begin with the Atlantic slave trade. It has been there uh, in the Greco Roman times, in the ancient times, in various African societies. And it went by different types of, um, it, it, it was operated differently. But in future, slavery was going to become an institution that would become um, very, very disturbing. So some of the epochs of slavery in Africa that took a large population of Africans, or including Nigerians, out of their countries or out of their societies. One was the Trans-Saharan trade. Uh, the Trans-Saharan trade was not mainly in slaves, but slaves were one of the items of the Atlantic slave trade, uh, the, the, the Trans-Saharan trade. And the slaves were used for two purposes. One, they were used as means of transport they transported some of the goods in the, in the, in the trans-Saharan trade. And then when they arrived at destination, both themselves and the goods they carried were sold. We don't know exactly how many people were involved in, that land, in the trans-Saharan trade. But from Nigeria, we were told that there was a preference for Hausa slaves in the trans-Saharan trade. And these slaves, we don't know how many were involved. Now, when I checked uh, Hopkins, who was quoting other sources, he talked about uh, Raymond Money saying that about 2 million slaves persons were involved in that slavery. Uh, Lewiski says that between um, 15 
12 to 15 million persons were involved, and that would put the figure almost at the same level at, as the Atlantic slave trade. But then we were not sure. Um, a Ghanaian economist by name George Aite put the number at 9 million African slaves involved in the trans-Saharan trade, but we don't know for sure. But what it means is that uh, at least some millions of Africans, including Nigerians, were part of this problem. Now, no. these slaves were used in the Arab world as domestic servants and as soldiers in their own armies. So they were not like brutalized and dehumanized as would come in the Atlantic slave system. Now the Atlantic slave trade is something that is well known in history. Uh, the main uh, human beings became the main articles and various African societies were involved in this. From Nigeria, the most affected societies were the Igbo areas called the Bight of Benin and the Bight of Biafra and then the Yoruba areas, particularly exported from Lagos and Porto Novo. So again, this was the, it took place like about four or five centuries between 1450 and 1866 when the last ship to Havana was arrested. Again, the numbers of persons involved is disputed. Cotton cited 9.6 million, in inquiry about 15 million. My teacher, the late Don Ohadike, thinks about 30 million persons were involved, including those who died to, from the hinterland to the coast and those who were thrown overboard. So the numbers are also um, huge. Then there's also the East African Arab slave trade, which is not much discussed in history. Uh, it, it involved a lot of um, Arabs coming to enslaved Africans from East Africa. And the story given by Ayete is, is such a bizarre one that he said many people were dehumanized, many people, many societies were raised, many people were killed and so on and so forth. But again, he suggests that about 20 million blacks were involved. Now, the East African uh, slave trade, of course, did not involve Nigerians, but it was basically people from East Africa. Now, each of the phases of this trade was destructive and had racist um, undertones. The earlier forms of slavery, for example, in the Trans-Saharan trade and also the Egyptian raids into the land called the land of the blacks, Bilad al-Sudan. Now, it was like stereotypical for them to come to the lands of the blacks to enslave them. And you know the role of slaves in the Egyptian um, well, We've just got a little problem at the moment with uh, the building of the pyramids in Egypt. Some of them again. found their ways to the Atlantic slave trade is the most is related to the um to, to 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 racism in in quite a number of ways and the person most often cited as having racialized the atlantic slave trade was a spanish priest by name Bartolome de casas now Bartolome de casas originally proposed that africans instead of the red indians should be used in the plantations in the west indies now he was appointed as the official protector of the uh, Indians. And so he had sympathy for them and then referred the slave slavers to Africa that the, the Africans were stronger. And one commentator, let me read what he said. He said, in making this argument, La Casas may have introduced inadvertently, may have inadvertently provided the Spanish government endorsement of the new idea of slavery based on race rather than the medieval concept of slavery as a result of war and conquest. Now, what this means is that racism was a very strong component of the Atlantic um, slave trade. And it was such a very bad thing for Africans. Now, how did Africans respond to uh, the slave trade and the racism 
that went with it. Of course, in Africa, there were slave rebellions. Many of these ones were unsuccessful. There were slave rebellions in the era of Agaja Trudeau in the Homi Kingdom. And then there were slave rebellions by the blood men in the Niger Delta. They called them the blood men and they were rebelling against the Ekpe society. Now, this slavery within Africa was not racialized, but that was a response to oppression and exploitation. In the West Indies, when we're talking of the racialized slaves, we see that in the 18th and 19th centuries, many of them also revolted against their masters and set up independent republics to which Jamaica, Haiti, Mexico, Veracruz, Hispaniola belonged. And the history of that is quite entirely a, a story for another day. But we see the success oh. of the rebellion. And quite a number of these slaves were also from Nigeria and from other parts of Africa. Now, when we come to colonialism, colonialism was again a phase in the, in, in the, in the experience of Nigerians and Africans with racism. In the colonial period, the foundation of colonialism was partially based on racism. And this had intellectual roots in the scientific revolution. Darwin, for example, proposed that oh. there is a theory or proposed a, the theory of natural selection. And according to him, only capable species managed to survive. So it was like the survival of the fittest. However, it was one uh, French person, Count Joseph Otto Gibbonu, who promoted ra um, a natural selection to a racist point of view. And I will read a few lines of what he said. And he said, the various branches of human family are distinguished by permanent and irreductible differences, both mentally and physically. They are an equal intellectual capacity in personal beauty, in physical strength, I arrive at the conclusion that the whole of our human society species is divisible into three great groups, which I can call primary varieties. The dark races are at the lowest on the scale. The shape of the felvis has a character of animalism, which imprinted on their individual, in the individuals of that race, at their birth, and seems to portend their destiny. The cycle of intellectual development of that group is more contracted than that of the other two groups basically showing that Africans are an inferior um, people. So with this, when colonialism came, led by the conquerors, they established their conquest on Africa on the premise that white people were superior to Africans. And therefore, they labeled Africans as barbarians, they labeled them as pagans, they labeled them as hellbound, they labeled them as um, people who are backward and incapable of development. And that ex because of these uh, perceptions, they now engage in the economic uh, exploitation of the continent. And then they develop also the hermetic hypothesis. Uh, R.G. Seligman, for example, wrote a book in the 1930s and claimed that the civilization of Africans was a civilization of Hamites, the dark-skinned people were incapable of development. And this is another form of racism. So when colonials settled to rule Africa, they therefore developed a template for dealing with Okay, we're just getting a break again now. with Africans on the basis of racial superiority and inferiority. So in the administration of blacks, including Nigerians. And then there was racial segregation in their settlement patterns. The Lugardian so-called 440 yards um, um, doctrine. So Africans were supposed to live in se separate places and then whites were supposed to live in separate places. They also had different social amenities. Where the whites settled, there was electricity, pipe bone water, wood roads, wood hospitals, Africans and Nigerians in, in particular 
had no access to these. So colonialism completely racialized the African society. So how did Nigerians or how did Africans and Nigerians in particular respond to colonial racism? Of course, the best way to, to, to deal with this is to look at African nationalism and nationalism was set in Africa. Now, nationalism has two uh, phases. There's the phase called primary resistance and there's also the call, phase called modern nationalism. Primary resistance was determined by Africans and Nigerians who refused to be conquered without resistance. They put up a fight against the conquering uh, British forces, although majority of the forces were Nigerians, but the leaders, the commanders were white people, were Britons. So Nigerians resisted the imposition of colonialism from Lagos to Sokoto, from Ibadan to the Niger Delta, all across Nigeria, the story, like in other parts of Africa, was conquest by force, but Nigerians resisted. Now, the second way they resisted colonialism was through cultural nationalism, and this had implications for racism. Some of them rejected, some people rejected the Western names and every effort at westernize, westernizing uh, the Nigerian society. So they rejected English names and took Nigerian names or inserted Nigerian names in their names. Uh, one of them was Reverend S. H. Samuel, who became Adeboga, Adeboyega Edun, and then George William Johnson became Oshaleke Tejumade. So many of them re rejected um, English names in preference to adopting Nigerian names. That was their own way of resisting um, racism. Then they also promoted African independent churches that allowed um, marriage of more than one wife, they, that allowed certain cultural practices in Africa to, uh, be, uh, to, to, to permeate the worship uh, uh, arena. Now, the second and uh, the third way they resisted was through tax revolts. There were many tax revolts. There was the Adube tax revolt in Egbalan, where the revolters attacked railway stations. Then there was the Aba women's riot, which is very popular. We know what it was about. The Aba women riot was actually a revolt of women in Eastern Nigeria against uh, the, 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 the fear that the women were going to be included in uh, the capital tax payment. So that riot was very, very destructive. They attacked European settlements, attacked European facilities, and of course, some women also lost their lives. Then there was also a tax revolt led by Fumilai Okuti. Uh, she led the Egba women again in 1947. For nine months, they were protesting against the imposition of taxes. So this, they, didn't, they, they, they didn't see the reason why uh, people should be taxed because they didn't see the benefit to Nigerians. They didn't see the benefit to the black race. They only saw the benefit going to the white man and they said they wouldn't pay. Then another aspect was labor union strikes. Um, Nigeria has a lot of history of labor union strikes, but the most commonly known and the most popular was the 1945 general strike led by Chief Michael Imodu, the militant labor leader. Now the strike was initially about cost of living allowance. Coming out of the experience of World War II, Nigerians were frustrated, inflation was going on, they couldn't, uh, the house rents were, were, were increasing, food prices were, in, were rising, but their salaries were not, and allowances were not uh, increased. So they demanded for a pay raise to meet up with these challenges. And then there was also some kind of racism in the payment of allowances. Expatriates were paid local allowance, even though their wives were not with them. But Nigerians who were forced to work over time were not paid anything. So Nigerians said, no, we will not do what we call uh, monkey the walk, baboon the chop. That is, will not work and another person is taking, they needed a salary increase, but the government said, if we raise salaries, there will be inflation. So there was a deadlock and then the strike was called 
and it lasted for 44 days in Lagos and 55 days in other areas because they didn't trust that the telegram calling of the strike was genuine. But then our government offered them 20%. They said, no, they won't take it. So the matter was referred to the Tudor Commission and the Tudor Commission eventually awarded them 50% on the cost of living index. And of course, the strike had been called off before then when it was about to collapse. So they discovered that uh, in order to prevent it from collapsing, they accepted to call a truce so that they can save jobs. And in that case, they said they can go to the Tudor Commission and the Tudor Commission made that very wonderful award. Then a third way, uh, another way Africa and Nigerians <laughs> responded to the colonial racism was through modern nationalism. The elite based mostly in Southern Nigeria um, formed political organizations like they were part of the National Congress of British West Africa that was established in 1920 in Accra. Now, that Congress made some demands because they sent a delegation to London. And one of the demands they made was that a legislative council should be established for each of the British territories. That means they were asking for political inclusion because they were excluded in the political thing. So if the white people um, held the political positions, it means that politics was racialized and they wanted to be included. Now, the other thing was that is directly related to racism is that they demanded for the abolition of racial discrimination in the service. As I said earlier, Africans and Nigerians could only occupy junior positions in the colonial service. They weren't allowed to go higher than that, regardless of their qualification. So race, racism determined who, whatever position one occupied in the colonial civil service. And they said, no, we can't continue like that. And they would get the reward for this later towards independence when the African civil service, the Nigerian civil service was Africanized with Nigerians taking over the positions of departing uh, Britons. They also asked for a university and that's how University of Ibadan was established and another one in Legon and then for a Bay College in Sierra Leone were established about this time. Now, as the British were granting concessions to the nationalists, the, on March 1953, in Ahoro from the House of Reps uh, representing Action Group, raised a motion that Nigeria needed to be self-governing in 1956, although the Northern establishment uh, countered that by amending it to say as soon as practicable, it meant that Nigerians were asking for self-government. Let the British, let the white people depart. And of course, it followed Nkrumah's doctrine. Um, seek ye first the political kingdom and all other things shall follow. Whether those things followed or not is another thing altogether. But nationalism stood for the end of colonialism. Now, in the post-independence era, the whites have gone, so no more racial discrimination. Nigerians now acquired the status of citizens, but then they felt that they were still operating under the British yoke in the sense that they felt imperiated. And one of the forms of imperialism they resisted was the Anglo-Nigerian Defense Pact. And many Nigerians thought that that was not a sign that Nigeria was a sovereign state. So the National Association of Nigerian Students um, led a demonstration. And so the pact of 1958 to 1961 was canceled. It wasn't reviewed, it wasn't renewed. So Nigerians claimed their sovereignty and earned their respect. Now, the next thing for Nigeria was to focus as an independent country on the liberation struggle in South Africa. So Nigeria contributed enormously to the fight against apartheid. Um, Nigeria did this by expressing solidarity, by forming committees, and by contributing money. Nigeria contributed to the lobby, to the expulsion of South Africa from the Commonwealth. And it paid an annual grant of $5 million to the ANC and to the Pan-African Congress in the 1970s. And between 1960 and 1995, Nigeria has spent about 31, uh, $61 billion in the campaign against apartheid. It also established a special um, uh, 
special um, grant for a research fund for South Africans so that they can have an education, so that they can cushion the effects of the suffering they were going through apartheid. Nigeria also granted free education to South Africans to come to Nigeria. And from, 1980, uh, from 1976, they started coming with the first batch of 86. Someone like um, um, Tabombeki, also during that period, came and had a, a short stay in Nigeria, about seven years stay in Nigeria under that kind of um, arrangement. And Nigeria refused to sell oil to South Africa and thereby lost some in oil revenues, all in the fight against apartheid. And of course, um, apartheid was eventually abolished, not because of, not just because of the Nigerian uh, fight, but because of the end of the Cold War. So Nigeria successfully fought racism in Nigeria and was part of the success story in fighting racism in South Africa. But then Nigeria's success in, at home and in South Africa has not been replicated elsewhere. That's why we still have racism staring us in the face. And as one professor has written, uh, the black skin has become a burden. It is regarded, anything black is regarded as a bad thing. So Africans, uh, things like black market, black mine, even Satan is regarded as black. So in the advanced or so-called racialized societies, the black skin is still looked at as, it is still a burden to the African people. And for some Nigerians or some Africans to escape it, they adopt this inferiority complex and begin to buy wigs, begin to buy cream so that they can change their skin and look light skin to fit into the labor market. And this is quite sad. And in Africa generally, many people have left the US and other particularly the US for Ghana in the 21st century to escape racism. There's Chinese racism in Kenya, there's Chinese racism in many African countries, the Angola and so on. And then there is racism practiced by China, even within China. So African students in China complain that they are receiving some kind of bad treatment. The story of Mark Dugan, the story of George Floyd, remind us that we still have problems of racism in Europe and in America. So how do we deal with this problem? I think it's something that requires all of us to um, find a solution to as a human community that is common to all of us. Now, because Nigerians have experienced racism differently from maybe South Africans or Southern Africans, some people from Southern Africa believe that Nigerians are not empathetic when discourse about racism comes. Uh, Shoyinka, for example, was quoted as uh, saying that a, a tiger does not need to, de to demonstrate its tigritude. And it was absolutely in response to negritude movement. The negritude movement was showing black is beautiful, black is good, but Shoyinka said that was absolutely useless because how can you say black is beautiful when you are in Africa? It doesn't make sense that do we need to demonstrate that? So some look at it as Nigerians are not empathetic because they don't understand the kinds of situations that other African countries are confronting. And so they don't understand, they, they have not experienced the racism that Southern Africans experience. They have not experienced the racism that maybe uh, people from other parts of Africa have experienced. But it doesn't mean that Africans and, and Nigerians are not empathetic. Many Nigerians condemn racism in their writings and in their encounters with it. Nigerian scholars like Falola condemn racism and his cohort in the US, they all condemn racism. So the story of Shoyenka's criticism of negritude is counterbalanced by the story of Falola and his colleagues who condemn racism. So Nigerians do not tolerate racism. They have fought it and will continue to fight it and they will empathize with others that are facing it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if you want to stop sharing now, I think that's the way you do it. Okay. Um, and then we can get all of us on the screen again if you want everyone. Well, 
Professor Sati, that was so interesting. And um, I also um, think you're going to uh, write us a sh or have written us a short paper that we can share with everyone, because I think oh. this is such an important topic. And it's really important that we see things from other people's point of view um, and listen. So this is a conversation. Um, lovely to see that several other people have joined us. Philippa, it's good to see you. We'll catch up with you in a moment uh, if you've joined us. Um, but first of all, um, have we got anybody who'd like to, to ask Professor Sati any questions or comment, first of all? Right, John? John, John you're muted. Okay, right. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, I've raised this before. It's a question of Pan-Africanism and where it is now, because you referred to it in the uh, on the screen and um, you mentioned various things there. Now, I, I'm trying to get a, a, an idea of where that is now. I mean, we're looking back and you mentioned Krumah, um, not so far away in West Africa. But I mean, uh, Pan-Africanism, first of all, I, I'm interested in it from the point of view that uh, the first reaction to the um, conferences in, in the conference in Berlin, uh, a group of people came together from Africa, from America, from Britain, and black people, and, and one Indian, um, Laroji, which was interesting, and uh, Pan first Pan-African conference. Congress, and there were further, particularly 1945, when Nkrumah and other leaders were involved. Um, but I mean, what happened in Africa, we talk about statues being taken down, when well, Nkrumah seems to have been, that seems to have happened. And, you know, I don't really know the forces behind that. Uh, was it American, UK US, uh, forces involved in that? And what's the situation now? Um, you talked about, you spoke about nationalism, which seems to give the idea of, of individual countries, but Pan-Africanism is talking about people getting together. So I've, I've no idea where that is as a force and what opposition there is to that, that kind of movement. I can see if it becomes powerful, then there's gonna be opposition. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, John, for that question. Um, Pan-Africanism is uh, really a very important topic in African history because um, it links with nationalism. It links the diaspora with the Africans in the homeland. Um, indeed, it, it's the root of nationalism because of the idea that um, Africans need to be independent and um, that if we take the Boas extreme arg argument that uh, Africans need to go back to Africa, uh, that was extreme, but at least it's a manifestation of the fact that maybe Africans in the diaspora then were facing extreme forms of racism and then it was important for them to come back where they were recognized. But then all linked to the fact that we need African sovereignty. Now, back to Africa, when the conferences of 1945 and subsequent ones um, were held, the apostles of Pan-Africanism uh, in, in Africa mainly were divided into two. There were centuries like Nkurmah and Nasser who thought that Africa should form one country with an African high command with, with a central army. There were others that were for confederation of which Nigeria, that was where Nigeria, Liberia, and so on stood. So they were called the so-called uh, conservative group, the Monrovia group as against the Casablanca group of the NASA and so on that were radical. Eventually the OAU charter was a compromise and it tended towards the uh, Monrovia group as against the centrist group. So Pan-Africanism led to the formation of the Organization of African Unity. 
as a continental platform for dialogue in the UN. And it, it, it has helped, for example, in raising one voice against apartheid. It has helped in pushing forward an agenda for the recognition of Africans in the international community. Whether at individual state levels, uh, these agendas are respected or not, is another matter altogether. But Pan-Africanism did give Africa a sense of unity in the Organization of African Unity, which is today the African Union. Um, Nkurma continued with his radicalism and was about to declare Ghana a socialist state when the coup occurred. But he had like strong views towards socialism, but when he was preparing for independence, he had to be careful so, so as not to be excluded from the political process. But once independence was gone, was, 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 was gained, he was tending towards, um, towards socialism. But then that was aborted with the coup that swept him off his feet. I don't know whether I have put some little perspective on the question you asked. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Hilary, have you got a point you'd like to raise? Yes, uh, I, I just want to follow on that very um, valuable um, information that Satya has provided. Um, an observation was that there were a considerable number of Caribbean people who were part of the Pan-African. I think there were three or four conferences held in Britain um, before 1945, and they included the Trinidadian, Sylvester, etc. But it seems to me that when the people got to the metropole and they were having a common experience of racism in Britain and or in the United States, it was much more easy to focus than what was happening out when they were in their own individual countries. And I think more attention needs to be paid to what happens in the metropoles because that gives people a common experience which maybe some had not got when they were in their separate countries. That's one issue. Um, secondly, I think that there was quite a lot of writing about these experiences. And of course, there were not only men involved in the Pan-Africanist movement, but there were also women um, whose contribution is often forgotten. Um, there's a Jamaican woman called Una Marson, who played quite an important role. And um, one of the Mrs. Garvey's, uh, Mrs. Um, Mrs. Ashwood Garvey, uh, was another one of those people. So I also think that the thing that had happened in Europe in terms of people fighting in the second, First and Second World War and returning to their countries, um, particularly the United States and to Britain on without any recompense, uh, whether it was the experience of the people who went back after um, through Windrush or the kind of things that were happening in, in America because I, I, and um, you may all be aware of the Claude McKay poem, which um, Winston Churchill quoted, which talked about, um, let us not be killed like dogs. Um, there was a, I, I, I've forgotten the name of the poem, but it's a very famous poem. And that really happened out of the African-American soldiers who returned, having fought in Europe, returning to segregated America and literally being lynched. And so, um, if we must die is the name of the poem. So I think that a lot of the things that were happening, there's a connection between what was happening in Europe and in the world in terms of the, the changes after the Second World War where people were demanding independence and wanting to end the old order. Um, and also the fact that people were then in the metropolitan settings, because the context is very important, as Satya has said, the experience in Nigeria is not the same experience in Southern Africa and so on. So I think that there's a lot more nuance and discussion that really needs to be, um, to be, taken, uh, to be taken seriously. And the final point I want to make is, people speak about these Africa as 54, not as 54 countries, you know, but as 
as almost as though it's monolithic. Clearly, there are so many differences as well as similarities that we somehow have to nuance. So thanks for Sati for bringing so much information about what was going on in Nigeria itself, some of which I was aware of and some that I wasn't aware of. Okay, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Hillary, for your comments. I think uh, I myself have benefited from the comments itself uh, themselves because um, history is really a very wide discipline and it's impossible to know all the names of those who did what until one has studied the different countries. Uh, even in Nigeria, uh, the, the, the point you made about the gender dimension of the struggle in Pan-Africanism and nationalism, we're just beginning to reconstruct and place women in their proper position. Uh, initially, before uh, the gender discourse became um, something on the table of historians, it was uh, really an agenda for social scientists and it was just an NGO thing. So we historians are, have started engaging with it, but we are late and have not yet built all the um, narratives about the participation of women. So thank you for that um, contribution. Um, of course, you're right, um, context matters. Anyone who has left Africa and is in Europe or America would need a different kind of racism because Africans are now minorities in those societies. So it's different than when they are back in Africa and they are majorities, and then uh, you have isolated cases of uh, racism, like we've talked about the Chinese racism in Kenya, where uh, a factory worker, a factory supervisor will go and set up a place and say, Africans don't go here, Africans don't go, or, or you see a Chinese person slapping an African person just because they're African, repeating the same thing that uh, the colonialists did a long time ago. So. This is a, these are contexts that um, matter a lot, but if this happened in Nigeria and they are reported, the, <laughs> the, the, the Chinese people will really be in trouble because Nigerians don't take kindly to any kind of racism in their place. And that's why Nigerians are believed to be very assertive. And the joke was told of a Kenyan woman who had given birth to five, four children. And when the husband requested for a fifth child, she protested, this is a joke. And when she was asked why she protested, she said she was told that one out of every black person is a Nigerian. So she had given birth to Kenyans and she didn't want to give birth to a Nigerian. The fifth one would be a Nigerian. So <laughs> Nigerians are <laughs> very, very assertive and wouldn't take uh, this kind of rubbish that we read from other countries. But again, context differ. There's a reason why some people are just quiet about it. Uh, levels of engagements differ, but thank you very much for your contributions and I have taken note. Thank you. Ray, would you like to comment? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, it was, uh, th thanks a lot for the, for the presentation, but uh, yeah, sometimes I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I have a contrary view here and I'm sorry if I, offend anyone. <laughs> uh, but I always look into, I'm always more concerned about the interactions between Black and non-Black. Um, I think it's, sometimes it's kind of convenient sometimes to say, well, yes, yeah, the other people, it's the other. Um, and I'm referring to things like um, the xenoph xenophobic attacks um, on, on Black uh, South Africans hacking to death um, Nigerians and Zimbabweans and Zambians. Uh, in broad daylight, set, setting them on fire. There's a lot of, lot of really horrible images out there. Uh, it was a few years, um, as well as last year. Uh, so I'm always inter interested in, especially the Pan-African um, thing, uh, the, the other time. I think it's, how, how do we um, bring back that idea and begin to look at the continent? Um, the richest man in Africa, Aliko Dangote, was lamenting the other time how, as, as rich and influential he is, how difficult it is for him to move around Africa because of multiple visas, <laughs> you know, all this real, uh, the barriers to him to even moving around Africa uh, alone. So maybe the Pan-African idea again, looking at the continent as one big continent, one, one billion people, all resources and everything. Can we come together as a people and start re revisiting these things? So because when I'm in the UK, I'm hearing people say, well, it's racism here. Someone painted Shrastika on my wall. Someone did it, all these other things. 
when we're trying to address that, then you see the videos of daylight hacking. So the images we saw South Africa in the 80s on television is white, you know, white folks dealing badly with, with black people. The images we've seen in recent times, um, it's black on black. Uh, so, so for me, it's just how, how do we address our own situation uh, and how do we, um, uh, I will stop now so I don't just um, go, go, in, go in off point. I figured, I, I read recently that um, Liberia, one of the oldest, um, you know, um, uh, you know, African um, countries, that the way that the Africans that returned to Liberia back in the day, uh, the way they treated the local uh, uh, Africans in Liberia, you know, there's a long, long story, you know, that, that, that connection. So for me, I just think we can do better um, as, as a people and begin to sort our own situation first, uh, and, and maybe eventually we'll, we'll, we'll get to sort solve the bigger uh, uh, situation. So I might be making sense or not, but that's just the way I view, view the world, really. Well, thank you very much, indeed. Yeah, thank you, Raymond. Um, thank you, Raymond. Yeah, and um, uh, you have, you have, you have, okay. So, uh, I, I think it, it's it is um, beholden to us to to look from different perspectives, as as uh, we said earlier. Um, it was interesting that uh, I was in a Rotary conference, um, worldwide conference, um, exploring the black experience in Rotary. And one of the things that came out quite clearly was that the different experience of black Rotarians in Africa, for example, was quite different to black Rotarians in, um, in, in the US and different again to UK or, or other countries. And so, I think it is looking at things from different perspectives. Um, Lindsay, um, you said thank you for raising that point about the brutality, Ray. That was a, a good point to, to raise the, the black on black. So, um, yeah. can, I, can I just add to that? Um, when I was living in Polokwane, which is right up in the north of Limpopo, um, there were lots of Zimbabweans coming down um, and there was, an, there was enormous attention because Zimbabweans were more inclined to work hard. And this, this I, I know, this is not just listening to chatter, but people were, the employees, whether they were working on farmlands or some in the businesses, were very interested and keen to employ Zimbabweans for a variety of reasons, including, as with most migrants, economic migrants, they are very, you know, that they've moved to improve themselves and very keen to work really hard. But also there was a discrepancy in the educational experience of Zimbabweans and South Africans. And one of the things that black South Africans have suffered from, which very rarely gets an airing, is the lack of education following the Soweto riots. The Soweto riots were 1976, um, and education was boycotted. And there was a whole generation of people who have grown up now and have become parents and grandparents who have very little direct education experience that was not interrupted by um, the very justifiable um, responses to um, that included the Soweto riots. So there was, there are all sorts of subtle discrepancies in there, which very angry black people in the part of South Africa that we were living in at the time, who were un, were, were were being passed over for employment um, by Zimbabweans. Nigerians, I think, tended to go further south and were more involved in trade. I don't know. Somebody, um, uh, Professor Sati, will know that better than I do. But in terms of general employment and looking for a good job, well-paid job, there was enormous tension in um, in those border areas, which was awful. And, you know, I don't know what it's like now, um, but it was a very real, tangible problem for, for lots of people. So thank you for raising it, Ray. Yeah, yeah it's an important point. This is Simon here. When I was in uh, Cape Town in about 2009, there was a lot of the, the black and black racism going on as well at the time um, because of the, the perception that they were coming and stealing jobs. And instead of making common cause against the people with the stranglehold on wealth, it was almost as if they were encouraged to, to be in conflict with, with each other. 
and there was a third group at the time um, who were poor white people, poor white South Africans who were also being dispossessed. And there was no, no common cause between anybody about why is there this wealth discrepancy which is bigger in South Africa than anywhere else in the, on the continent that I've been to. So it's yes, and, and I don't know again, because I haven't been back to South Africa for a while, I don't know what the situation is today, whether it's improved, but I hope it has. I, I would doubt that it has, Simon. And there were, again, that there was it was there was no common cause. There were white people who were who were no longer because apartheid protected them, so they had something. Mm -hmm. But when that went away, and once the euphoria of people who were pleased about it settled down, you had a whole series of a whole population of white people, poorly educated, um, um, living in poverty as meritocracy started to have some kind of imp impact and they were moving in to live in campsites so they were setting yeah, up i saw um, one of the campsites yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 i visited one and um yeah but it was just for me it was the um and it, it's a little bit similar to the problem here with with immigration is poor britons and migrants should be making common cause yeah. because they are both victims of the same thing which is growing inequality uh, and so some of some of this should, you know, has, has solutions, but, you know, and again, there's a failure probably of groups like trade unions to, to make that case, which is you have a common enemy. So work together, don't, don't allow people to make you fight each other when you are, you know, your, your enemy is the same. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I think uh, black on black violence has to be contextualized because it also has a history and part of it goes back to the period of the struggle against apartheid. When the um, major world powers that supported the apartheid regime armed the regime to deal Just lost Professor Sati for a moment. Yeah, you're back again. We do, we've done remarkably well today. There have been a few little breaks with the, uh, with the link with Nigeria, but considering I'm talking to you from Victoria in Australia, then it's truly remarkable. And Lisa's there listening in Texas. Um, yeah. Oh. Right, well, we'll come back to Professor Sati when he, his uh, connection's back again. Uh, so, are there any other comments that anybody else wants to, to raise on this? If not, we'll just um, allow people who've, um, yes, I think he's lost the connection altogether this time. Okay, then, right, let's just uh, just move on with uh, with other things that, um, that we've got. Um, uh, Philip, I didn't welcome you. It's good to see you. Would you like I to introduce you for being late. Sorry? All right. Would you like to introduce yourself to us? Um, well, I can do. Um, I, I don't have um, an academic history in, in um, your researches, but in fact, the reason I was late is because I was at my own local museum um, uh, doing uh, something in the collections and it, um, it took a bit longer than I thought. Um, Where are you based, Philippa? I'm based Where in North Wales, based? in North Wales. Oh. So, um, uh, away from everybody else. But I have okay. had a long chapter in South African and a shorter one in uh, the Caribbean. Um, fairly sheltered, I might add, in um, the situation I was in. Um, but um, my first five years in, in Zululand was um, a... a mix of people working together um, for the good of everyone else and um, that that was my introduction to Africa. Uh, we did move to the city in Durban um, which didn't really follow the apartheid rules, they were quietly disobedient um, and um, but I, I didn't engage in politics particularly. I was much younger, I had a young family um, and I guess I did grassroots stuff like, um, um, yeah, beginning a play group um, 
typical a TV. Okay, just before we hear the rest of your life story, because oh, sorry. Sounds- yeah. And we want to hear more about this. Just to say a very, very big thank you to you, Professor Sati. We uh, we lost the connectivity there for a little while. So um, I'm just going to wrap this up formally now and then we can carry on with the conversations afterwards. OK, so thank you very, very much indeed. And next week we're looking forward to an interesting session as well that Simon's going to be leading. So we'll be sending out information about that. So thank you. So if you want to stop the recording, Simon, that's fine.